a very warm good evening to everybody and first of all uh, thank you so much dr salini jaggi a very close friend of mine and dr rajiv chawla sir a mentor of mine for this kind of opportunity and i wish the conference a grand success as always it has been so today my job is cut out i've been asked to speak on diabetes and erectile dysfunction and i think this is a very important topic and i'm very honored to speak on this topic and and i'm very grateful that the organizers have kept this topic for the meeting so i think before i say that i'm gonna say i've been guilty i've been guilty of not being able to provide all patients that have come under my remit the right treatment in my training years and that is the purpose of the talk so that people who listen to me do not do the same mistake that i have done because the ultimate ignorance is not rejection of something you know nothing about yes refuse to investigate so something that you don't know you need to and you and you are refusing to investigate it's an ultimate ignorance you see we are a representative of what our childhood is what our beliefs have been what we have seen in life what we believe or what our parents have taught us and that actually creates the basis of bias in our clinical life you know i i born in an era where tom and jerry could never be friends and when i saw this picture on the side the life of dog cat and mouse i find it difficult to believe because it goes against the whole ecosystem of my upbringing it goes against all my comical a cartoon network has destroyed in my presence and this is what is very important when we deal with sexual medicine is very important when we deal with diabetes and sex we need to keep our bias in the cupboard and lock it and go to the clinic and see these patients with a fresh mind with no bias as to what you would say no bias that you will say are you have become old for to get sex no bias that you say are if you are having sex once someone that is good enough no bias in saying that you know it doesn't matter at this point of time if you have sex or not you must treat this patients with an open mind because it takes a lot of guts with a patient who has got sexual dysfunction to come and ask you for help and you may be the only hope in his life because if you dismiss this patient he may not have the courage to go to some other person that you there because there's a dichotomy in clinical practice because we clinicians ask about in diabetic clinics we would ask about blood pressure cholesterol feet eyes but we don't talk about sex and we believe if he has a problem he's going to bring it out and similarly the patient believes that the doctor has got such a long list of asking us if he felt that sex would be affected by diabetes he would ask me and this dichotomy who suffers is the patient and i remember long ago when sort of few years ago now when i was in england i was there for 14 years and i was doing an adolescent diabetes clinic and i was faced with a 14 year old man boy or men whatever you can call them young men and i was trying to tell him look you need to get your diabetes under control because, because this may improve your you know reduce your risk of complications micro and macrovascular and blah 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 and he was listening but he was not listening and then he asked me a question doctor you tell me what is something that will affect that will have an impact on my life as a youth and i said this may affect your sex life and trust me He he just converted into a new leaf. He got his sugar under control. Everything was under control. So you must hit the iron where it is hot. Not just for the purpose of getting his sugar control, but you are well aware that diabetes increases your risk and complications of sexual problems. And in men, erectile dysfunction is the most common side effect that are there. Now we are all clinicians, and when we are clinicians. it's important to talk about in a case based scenario because that kind of makes the essence of a talk and that's what we do in real life so if i bring up a, a talk of a 60 year old diabetic comes to us with erectile dysfunction he tries a cheap pd5 otc you see in india pharmacy sells everything even without the license of a pharmacist and it did not help him and the total duration of sex is 2 minutes and he comes to you he's paid your consultation he needs advice and he ask you what should i do doctor you you know you see what answer you going to give are you going to say look prescribe you've taken a cheap pd5 take a branded pd5 you're going to say so get sildenafil try a longer acting a weekend tablet like tadalafil you're going to tell him you're too old 
or none of the above. I'll give you a few seconds to recap and understand this scenario. It's a very common scenario that has come to us. Because what you need to understand in this patient, what is he trying to tell you? And so with that, let me go to the physiology of erection. I'm going to go back to the scenario. You see, we have five sense organs in our body. When these five sense organs are stimulated, the sex, organ, the sex center in the brain is stimulated and the sex center in the spine is stimulated. When the sex center is spine is stimulated, there's nitric oxide secretion and via the cyclic GMP pathway, there's secretion of guanyl cyclase and there's cavernescent smooth muscle relaxation and there is benign erection. Now, well, then the erection goes down because of the PD5 enzymes, the cyclic GMP is converted into cyclic, uh, you know, back into the pathway of GMP. And so this is where the PD5 inhibitors work upon in reduction. This. So what PD5 does is that it keeps the blood in your penis a, a little bit more longer so that you get an erection. So I think the, the scenario what we're talking about, you need to understand is that people get often confused between ejaculation and erection. And it's very important that you understand this and prescribe the right medication whether the patient has an erection problem if he doesn't have an erection problem there's no point prescribing any of pd5 inhibitors so if, the, if he's going to ejaculate early then the problem is the ejaculatory problem not the erection problem so that must be very clear for you to understand when you speak to this patient question number two a 45 year old high profile couple says that once he is ejaculated it takes time for him to get an erection so what do you do in this scenario do you tell the patient you do better sugar control you do tighter vascular control do nothing you give him viagra again and you say i've often heard clinicians saying this you try with somebody else and that should never be the advice for a medical profession and shouldn't be advised by anybody and i think if you go back to the days of physiology long long ago mine is 25 years ago now we just celebrated 25 years of medical life is that I remember in class 11 and 12, we, need, we had to stimulate the nerve of a frog and we saw the muscle twitching of the frog. And before the muscle twitching of the frog happened, second time there was a gap before you could stimulate that again. And that, my friend, is the reality of this scenario, that it takes time for the person to reload the gun for him to get another erection. Because if you look at the model of Master in Johnson four phase model, there's excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. And in a woman, this cycle, there are multiple cycles happening at the same time, whereas a man is monoorgasmic. Once this has happened, there's a refractory period before which the second stimulation. goes to Dr. Jackie's clinic and Charles's clinic. A Google dial they come with a lot of information in Google. Read that erectile dysfunction leads to heart attack. And he had erectile dysfunction three years ago and he wants to know if this was true. So did his uh, erectile dysfunction lead to his heart attack three years ago, which is heart. So is this the answer always yes? The answer is always no. Or use a get out of jail card, do something, say, come back, we'll talk about it. Or partially, yes. I think to understand this question, we need to go back to the vascular tree. We need to go to this excellent paper by Montasi. When he said that when there is 50% luminal obstruction, there is symptoms. You see, the penile artery is between 1 to 2 millimeter. The heart artery is between 2 to 3 millimeter. And so on and so forth. And if there's 50% occlusion, there is symptom. So if the penile artery, if there is 50% obstruction, there will be erectile dysfunction. And similarly, if uh, the uh, cardiac arteries got 50% occlusion, there are going to be symptoms. So if there's a small pipe and a big pipe, and obviously if it comes to us with erectile dysfunction, at a time we had minimized these vascular risk factors, we could have prevented, not necessarily, but we could have prevented 
uh, a full blown myocardial vascular event that was happening. So ED is equal to endothelial damage. Um, and we need to actually take care to bring things under control. The other factor which I'm going to bring about is when we're going to sit in a clinic and we're going to talk about sex, you need to make sure that you are comfortable talking about sex. Because if you are not comfortable talking about sex, the patient is never going to be comfortable. Especially if you're going to do a, a combined consultation with the men and, you know, the husband and wife or the boyfriend, the girlfriend, whatever you can call it. Because it's very important to be comfortable. And trust me, you know, patients understand the body language. You need to understand why he's come. If he's had this problem for God many 10 years, why today has his wife threatened him? You know, there could be a variety of reasons why this patient is presented today. And that should be understood. And what is more important to be understood is you must understand the lingo of the patient as hard, as crude as the local language may be. You might, it is better to talk to the patient in his own language because sometimes the linguistic barrier may, he may say he's got erectile dysfunction, but what he means to say is something completely different. So I think expansion of the question is very important and you need to give concrete time to this patient to understand what he's trying to understand because till he doesn't understand, you don't understand, you will not be able to prescribe. Every solution is not a PD-5. You need to understand his ideas, his uh, concerns, and his expectations that he's come to see you so that you can together formulate a plan of action which will be in his interest. You may want to take a more you know, extensive medical history of the patient, understanding his medications, recreational drugs, and social history. And you must understand that what are you going to do in this diabetes clinic because you know when we are sitting in a diabetes clinic i feel my job is to prevent to get him a quality of life that he or she deserves and sex is an important part of the quality of life it is important to understand that i cannot cure diabetes and it's understand that sex is an important part of our life and erectile dysfunction to a larger extent can be supported can be improved for these patients now there's a lot of hoo-ha about testosterone. So I'm just going to send the last few slides on testosterone uh, because people check testosterone for erectile dysfunction. A lot of labs do testosterone in part of their packages that you get and you are the interpreter of this report. So let me get you, you are there are a lot of studies, you know, there are a lot of FDA guidelines which, you know, cause a lot of threat to testosterone. I think testosterone should be prescribed for people who are comfortable prescribing and who are dealing with it on a daily basis. If you're not dealing with it on a daily basis, if not abreast of the recent advances in testosterone treatment, please do not go, uh, you know, burn your hands or burn the patients with testosterone. So let's look at a T4DM study. This look was an excellent study done in Australia. It's a double man placebo control to year phase three we tried. It involved six Australian tertiary care centers, involved more than a thousand men. They wanted to see if testosterone therapy prevented regression or reversed early type 2 diabetes beyond the effects of the community based lifestyle program. And the results were outstanding. There was a 41% reduction in T2DM prevalence with testosterone replacement versus placebo. So I think important fact which i'm going to conclude my slide on is what appears is not just true you might see a well-built person and handsome person but that is it's, mean to have erectile dysfunction. it's very important to bring about the subject in a delicate manner and address it because this patient will be yours for life and you will get good wishes for this from this couple throughout your life if you can sort this little bit of, just took a little bit of insistence in talking about the problem. With that, I would end my talk. I would say men can survive earthquakes, experience the horrors of illness and all of the tortures of the soul, but most tormenting tragedy of all time will be the tragedy of the battle. This is Leo Tolstoy. And with that, I once again thank the organizers, Dr. Jackie and Dr. Chawla for giving me the opportunity uh, to present in this uh, outstanding meeting that they've conducted. Thank you so much.